Welcome to Jurassic World. Our DNA excavators discover new species every year, but consumers want them bigger. Were those claw marks always there? Louder. It doesn't make any sense. More teeth. The Indominus Rex, our first genetically modified hybrid. You just went and made a new dinosaur? It's a camouflage! Corporate felt genetic modification would up the wow factor. They're dinosaurs, wow enough. You know that I'm not at liberty to reveal the asset's genetic makeup. Modified animals are known to be unpredictable. You cannot have an animal with exaggerated predator features without the corresponding behavioral trait. I never asked for a monster! Monster is a relative term. To a canary, a cat is a monster. We're just used to being the cat. You made a genetic hybrid, and you have an M134 in your armory. Put it on a chopper and smoke this thing. We have families here. I'm not going to turn this place into some kind of a war zone. You already have. <laughs> she be ready. She already is. This is my theory on, on the clip we just watched. When the, the very beginning, when the little dinosaur is hatching, right? And it's like coming out of the egg and you hear that music and that heartbeat, that's, that starts. You know what's, what the story is gonna be about, right? And like the first five seconds of the film, it opens up, a little dinosaur pokes its eye out, you know, and there's the, <laughs> the heartbeat and like this, this like terrible sounding music. You know that it's not going to be like, uh, uh, or rather, it is going to be in this action-packed, scary, you know, intense film about dinosaurs. Now, if the facility here, if they hired a janitor, and you had Gus the janitor, and you had this little dinosaur hatching out of this egg, and this ominous music playing, you know what Gus the janitor would do, don't you? It's like, wow, look at this, this tiny, tiny baby dinosaur. It's a marvel of modern science. I hear this music playing. Fixed it. And then the credits would all roll, right? And it's like, it's over. And it, you'd be there, like, just, just breaking into your $18 bag of popcorn. You're like, wait a second. Gus the janitor, he just he killed the baby dinosaur. The movie's over, right? There's no, there's no explosions. There's no helicopters. There's no there's no struggle. <laughs> but what would Gus's explanation be, right? The scientists come in and they say, don't you see what you've done? This was a marvel of modern technology. We modified all these genes and chromosomes and other humongous words, and we made these dinosaurs. Why did you do that? What would, what would Gus the janitor say? He'd go, but it's a dinosaur. <laughs> Solved it. <laughs> Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> it's a short movie. Instead, there's no Gus the janitor. Instead, it's a scientist, and the, you know the the dinosaurs proliferate and get huge and have all these special powers, and a bunch of people die. That's what makes the movie fun to watch. But let's read this verse in James because the idea of this this progression from these these tiny baby dinosaurs moving into these big scary dinosaurs that shoot lasers and whatever they do in the movie, listen to how similar this verse is. In James chapter 1, verse 13 through 15, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God can't be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Now listen to this next part. This is really interesting. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. 
That sounds an awful lot like the movie that we are just watching. There is a progression to sin. There is a progression to this, whatever it is inside of us, our brokenness, our lostness, whatever it is that compels us to want things that we know are not good for us, right? You have this progression, and you guys, everyone is aware of this. We all know this, right? It starts as desire. It starts as something that Gus the janitor could just stamp out, right? There, is, there are multiple stages that James is talking about in this scripture, and he says, he says that we're, people are drawn away when they're enticed by their own desires. It's something that you just want. It's an intent. It's something that is inside. It's something that, that draws us. And it's, it's different for each person. We've all made that mistake before. When someone struggles with something that we don't, we personally, then we think it's just easy to overcome. You know, I, I don't personally struggle with gambling, right? I, I don't know that gambling is really like a sin, like a, in the Bible or something, but but it's just not the thing that I struggle with, but some other people do. And so they're drawn to that. And if I make light of that and just go, oh, well, that wanted to just stop, that's, they might say the same thing that I struggle with in my life. But you have this idea that anything that we get sidetracked with, anything that is destructive, you know, like these rampaging dinosaurs in our life, it starts off, it doesn't start off as a full-blown dinosaur. It starts off in that little stage, that egg stage, that, that where that problem was very, very easy to deal with, right? When the, the dinosaur hatches, it's going to turn into something very deadly. But in that desire stage, in that beginning stage, it's something that you can arrest very quickly, immediately. And, uh, I mean, the point that I'm trying to make, just so that it will really drive it home for you. Here, throw this up on the screen. If you guys need to write something down, this is something that you can write down and that I'm sure you'll remember. Dinosaurs are way easier to kill when they're tiny babies, right? Like this guy. Dinosaurs are way easier to kill when they're tiny babies than when they are full-grown, camouflaged T-Rexes, right? When it comes to our our life, when it comes to sin, when it comes to, and we're going to talk about more what sin is, when it comes to those things in our lives that are destructive, those habits, those cycles that we just fall into over and over and over again, it is much, much easier to arrest that cycle when it is in that tiny desire baby stage than it is when that thing goes out of control and has ruined our life. How many of you have, I guess you don't have to raise your hand, but Lots of times we notice the destruction, right? We notice it after that thing has grown up, after that thing is like knocked down buildings and it's eaten, you know, our friend and it's, you know, just totally wrecked our life. We're like, wow, we got to get this under control, but we can't because it's a huge dinosaur. What are we going to do? It's a dinosaur. And that's the whole point of what we're trying to talk about today is that arresting that cycle early on is very, very helpful and it's much easier. Why doesn't everybody do that? Why doesn't everybody just stomp that thing when it's young? Why don't people notice that this desire I have is wrong, right? Even before it, it gives birth, you know, in, in the scripture here, it says it gives birth to sin, and then eventually that gives birth to death. But why don't people just stamp it out? Why don't people re just recognize this is the thing that I struggle with? I know it's wrong. I'm just going to kill it, nip it in the bud while it's young and while it's easy to deal with. And you'll remember from that clip that when the two scientist guys were talking to each other, they were wondering, why is this thing, why does it have camouflage? Why does it have this feature? Why was it able to hide and attack all the human guys? They were like blown away. And that's the same, that's the same exact thing that happens in our lives with the things that we struggle with. It's camouflage. It's how many of you have, you know somebody who has a glaring character flaw? They have a glaring thing that is just short-circuiting the success in their life. It's like they can't hold down a job, they can't hold down a relationship, and, it, and to you, it's the most obvious thing in the world, but to them, it is just totally camouflaged. It's just totally hidden from them. How many here watch Seinfeld? I have to work in like a Seinfeld reference at least once a sermon, right? So Jerry and Kramer and, and uh, George are at the gym and they just got done playing basketball and they're having an argument right and George is like kind of the short he's like the, the dorky one of the bunch and they're having an argument because Jerry goes well George asks he says why haven't you guys been passing to me no one passes to me and Jerry says he says well 
it's kind of hard to bring this up and it's hard to tell you, but you're a chucker, right? And George goes, a chucker? What's a chucker? And he goes, well, anytime you get the ball, you just shoot. <laughs> Doesn't matter where you are. You get the ball and you just shoot it and you always miss. And George goes, no, nope, I'm not a chucker. Never been a chucker, never will be a chucker, never chuck, don't chuck, I'm not a chucker. And he goes, Kramer? And Kramer goes, oh, you're a chucker. <laughs> and George goes, I can't believe it. I can't believe it, I'm a chucker. How, how come no one ever told me before? And Jerry goes, well, it's not an easy thing to bring up. <laughs> how many of you felt that way? When someone has a glaring issue, they have a problem, they have something and you're like, if you could see the 600 pound gorilla in your life, like everyone else sees it, things would be okay. You would get it figured out. <laughs> like so many things would go better. <laughs> but it's awkward to bring up. <laughs> you're a chucker. George, you're a chucker. I can't believe it. I'm so ashamed. I didn't know that I chucked. <laughs> Sin camouflages itself. Shortcomings, character flaws, human beings are prideful. We do not want to look at, ourself, at ourselves in a realistic way. It's just, it's just human nature. I mean, we get better at it, and it's not to say that everyone is, you know, walking around with these horrible character flaws that they don't know, but most people have something that we just, we're just not aware of, or, or we justify it. We find some way to justify it. We, well, no, it's just how I was born, or no, that's just you know, my upbringing, or this, that, or the other, and you're like, no, it's, it's just something that you, you don't see. You don't see it right, and if, if you changed it, your life would be so much better. I'm not trying to like impute your sin. Oh, you know what you do, and it's really lame, is this. No, it's just if you saw this about yourself, but it's hard when sin camouflages itself. Now, a little tiny baby dinosaur, it doesn't need camouflage, right? That's like little teeny tiny sins. It doesn't need that much work. It doesn't need that much to hide. But that big humongous T-Rex or whatever it's called dinosaur, that one needed like all kinds. And this is the next point, right? The bigger the dinosaur, the bigger the problem, the bigger the sin, the bigger the dinosaur, the better the camouflage has to be. And it's exactly the same way in our lives. You have dealt with this. I have dealt with this. Everybody has noticed this before. People, including ourselves, camouflaging, hiding, circumventing, figuring out a way to justify things in our life that we know shouldn't be there. And we get better and better at it with more practice. You get more conniving. You get more smart. You get more coy. Because the biggest problems that we have, the biggest sin issues, the biggest shortcomings that we have require the very best camouflage. They require the most to keep them tucked away, to keep them safe inside. Does that make sense? The bigger the dinosaur, better the camouflage. So how can you tell in your own life that sin is sin? How, do, how are you able to to see past your own shortcomings? How am I able to see past? If something is camouflaged, if something is, is in me that is wrong, but I, I can't identify it, I can't change, there's a couple of, of things to remember, a couple of ways to look at it. Number one, sin is never satisfied. Sin is never satisfied. There is a cycle, there is a progression of sin, and you have probably experienced this before. And if you're new here, and if you have never been in a church, and you don't normally talk about this kind of stuff, that's totally fine. Maybe you say, I don't know what sin is, and you kind of have this picture of this old man in the sky, God, this mean old man in the sky. And basically, sin is all the fun stuff that you want to do, but you're not allowed to because the old man in the sky will get mad at you if you do that, right? If you do the fun stuff, then you'll get in trouble. And really, that's not a biblical idea of sin. Sin is, is, is missing the mark. It's lots of times it's wanting the right kind of things, but wanting them in the wrong way or the wrong time or with the wrong person. Does that make sense? I mean, lots of, lots of desires that we have aren't bad. It's not a bad desire to want a relationship, even sexual companionship, it's not wrong to have a deep, deep desire for that. It's not wrong to want to have 
uh, an abundant life. It's not wrong to want to have, you know, things. It's not, there's a lot of things that they're not wrong in and of themselves, but when you go about getting them in the incorrect way, when you go around, uh, about getting uh, sexual companionship, about relationships that are destructive, about conniving for money or cheating or stealing or selling out or whatever, the base root drive might not necessarily be wrong. Oftentimes it's not. It's the way that we, that we go about it. And it's wrong not in a mean old man's going to throw fire and brimstone. I don't really think that's the, the point. I think it's that it destroys our life. Right? Dangling the carrot, this is the life you could have if you just cheat. Just like Satan did when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Look at these good things that you want. You can have the kingdoms of the world. You can fix stuff. You can take care of people. You can feed the hungry if you'll just give in. Look at all these amazingly good things that you can do if you give in to me. It wasn't a, te a temptation to do something evil. It was a temptation to do something good. And so many times in our lives, that's the temptation is we want something good, but it's the wrong time. It's with the wrong person. It's in the wrong way. And I don't think God is up like ready to hurl fire and brimstone at people because, you know, they crossed him. I think God is like, these are my children that I want the best for. And oftentimes they choose the worst thing for them and they end up in a world of hurt. They end up broken. So how can you tell sin is sin? It's never satisfied. It's never satisfied. And everyone has experienced this before. You're into something, doing something you shouldn't be doing, watching something you shouldn't watch, being with someone you shouldn't be with. And at the end of the day, you don't feel content. You don't feel like, I had, I had just enough and now I'm fine. Right? It's always, I need more of that thing. I need more. And sin always gets, it has to be more, it has to be weirder, it has to be darker. It, 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 it consumes forever. There is no end to what it wants. That's, that, when you have a barbecue with your family on a nice summer evening and, you, and at the end of the day you go, you know what, that was really fun. I'm content. I had a great time. It, I don't want a barbecue for 27 days straight. Some of you do. You're like, yeah, fire up the grill. Throw another shrimp on the bobby. And the right amount is the right amount. And you say, man, I'm glad I did that. Or you have a nice dinner with somebody. You're hanging out with a friend or whatever it is. And you go, man, I'm content. That was good. That was a good amount. That was a good thing. I'm glad that I did that. Sin is never like that. It's, you never go, you know what? I'm glad I did that. That made my life so much better. And, uh, you know, I just, just a pinch, just a sprinkle. And I'm totally fine. It's not the way that it is. This is why addiction is addiction. This is why drug users, I mean, they, they've done studies. They, they get to a certain amount of addiction, and then when, if they quit and get clean and they go back, they don't start over at a little amount like they first started. They go right back to the hardest drugs and how much they were doing before. It happens with all sorts of addiction because sin by its nature, it grows. It progresses. It goes from being something small, a desire, something that you could just say, I want to do this, but I'm not going to because I know it's wrong. But the second that you just let that seed of a thing start, it grows into something that is worse and bigger and more destructive. It's never, it's never satisfied. The point is there is always a bigger dinosaur. There's always a bigger dinosaur. Now, in the clip we just watched, you had the bad dinosaur that was trying to kill him, and then you had still a bad dinosaur, or it was a bad dinosaur from the last movie, but it was fighting the new bad dinosaur, and at the end, there was an even bigger bad dinosaur hiding in the water that jumped out and dragged it underneath. <laughs> what a fitting description. There is always a bigger dinosaur. There is always a new type of sin. There's always a new progression. There is always more, more, more in the cycle until it eventually ends in death. That's what it says in James. And some of you have experienced this before. I don't think it means you just keel over dead, but I think that it means it brings death to the areas of your life that are most important to you. 
brings death to marriages, brings death to family relationships, it brings death to careers, it brings death to, most importantly, our relationship with God. It brings death in almost area of our life, especially the most important areas, if you let it get there. If you let it get to that point, you don't have to. You don't have to. Lots of people come in, and whether you have stepped in, a, in, in the door, stepped foot in the door of a church or not, everyone has experienced the draw of sin, the, the chains or the bondage of addiction to something, something you don't want to be a part of, but something about you just draws you to it over and over. And whichever you might be, the whole gamut, don't know anything about God, or you've been going to church for 50 years, and you've been carrying around baggage that you don't want anybody to know about. It's, it's, it's the same problem, and it's the same solution for both. The difference is that God made a very specific way for us to deal with the sin that's in our life. And not just sin in the sense like, oh, I've done something wrong and I need forgiveness. The sin that has broken us. The sin that is like a fundamental just desire that we have to do something that is wrong. The good news is God has made a way to break that cycle. You, whoever you are, you can end that cycle. You can, no matter how big the dinosaur is, it's easiest to kill that thing when it's a baby. But if it's grown up and it has been rampaging through your life and you have things that you're not proud of, you have things that are embarrassing, things that you're ashamed of, things that you think should separate you from God for the rest of eternity, I'm telling you, you're wrong about that. God can and does save. And you're asking, well, how do I change my intentions? How do I become that kind of person? How do I make it so that I don't want this cycle in my life anymore? And that is the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel, the word gospel means good news. The good news is that God is not a mean, angry old man in the sky. He's not looking to take away everybody's fun. He's looking to give people more fun. <laughs> He's looking to give people more joy. He's looking to give people actual contentment, not anxiety over, uh, are people going to find out who I am? Are people, people going to find out what I've done? Um, how do I get more? How do I look like this in public and really be like this in private? That is the absolute opposite of what God is trying to provide for you. God wants you to be content. God wants you to find freedom. God wants you to say, I, I, I used to be messed up in some stuff, but God was willing not just to save me and to forgive me, but to do something internally, to do something in my heart that has totally changed my desires. That is what conversion is. The word conversion, to convert, to be different. I used to want these kinds of things. I used to run in these kinds of circles. I used to be around these kind of people, but God changed who I was, and now I'm different. I'm a different sort of person. I want different things. And that is why Christian people oftentimes are so happy. <laughs> That's why there's so much joy in the Christian faith. That's why there's laughter. That's why there's freedom. That's why when you come into church and you're about in a bad mood and someone is dancing next to you, you're like, how dare you? Who dances? Who dances in public? Especially when they dance terribly like me. But the good news of the gospel is that God saves. He changes us. He forgives us. He makes us into a new creation. And if that's you, if you're here and you say, I have wrestled that dinosaur. <laughs> I have let that thing just become a huge problem in my life. I have, I have failures. I have foibles. I have flaws. And I don't know how to be a Christian. I, do, I don't know how to be saved. I don't know how to buy into this thing that you are talking about. I'm here to tell you, it's fairly simple. You say yes to God. Not the mean, angry old man in the sky. You say yes to God, the Father. The Father who cares about you, who wants the best for you, who wants the most joy, the most happiness, the most contentment. 
He wants to do away with bondage and addiction. He wants to do away with anxiety. He wants to do away with feeling like you're not good enough, like you've gone too far, like you've crossed the line too many times, like you are estranged from him and he could never find you and you could never find him. God is always looking for reconciliation. And he doesn't take us back as a prisoner. He doesn't take us back as a servant and say, okay, fine, I guess I'll let you in the club for a while. He takes us back as children. He only takes us back as children. But it takes us saying in faith, God, I'll be your child. If you'll change the inside of me, if you will change the person I've been, if you will take away and pay for this stuff that I've done, I'll be different. Not I'll try to work myself up into a different kind of action, but I'll be different because you've changed me. Saying yes to God and letting him change your heart. He chose to pay for your sins and for mine by the death of his son. He chose to pay. And if you want to make that prayer, if you want to say, God, I accept that gift. I accept your payment. I accept that you will take your sins on yourself and that won't be mine anymore, but you'll, you'll change my intentions. I'm going to pray a prayer right now and I invite you to just repeat after me. It's simple. It's easy to do, but it has to come from the heart. Then you have to mean it. And God will save you. Repeat after me if that's you. Dear Jesus, I trust your sacrifice. I can't deal with sin. I can't fix it. I can't continue to cover it. I can't act good enough to be like you. But if you'll save me, if you'll pay my way, if you'll forgive me, if you will allow me into your family, I'll be your child. I appreciate what you've done for me. I trust that you can save me. In Jesus' name, amen. And God, I pray for the whole group here. I pray that you'd bless each person here. Father, we do not want to carry around sin and separation from you. God, we don't want to carry around baggage. We don't want to carry around darkness. We don't want the vexation of having addiction and cycles in our lives that make us feel like we can't talk to you and that you can't talk to us. They make it, us feel like we're not good enough, like you don't like us, you're not willing to be around us. God, I pray that if there are those here who suffer with just the doubt and regret of sin, Father, that you'll teach each person that you are here to save them and to change them, that there's victory, there's an opportunity to be a different person in your family. God, I pray that you're, the good news of your gospel will touch each person's heart, Father, whether they've been here a long time or whether they're coming in for the first time today, that the power of your gospel, Father, will change our hearts and minds. God, we want to be like you. We want to be near you. We don't want there to be one thing that gets in the way of our communication with you or with other people. God, I pray you bless each person here today in Jesus' name. Amen.